Hello and welcome back. So I've been developing a new game for the system and developing games for this is one of the reasons why I started this whole project in the first place. So it's been a very enjoyable experience for me. So rather than start off by talking, let's jump straight in and have a look at it. And then we'll talk later on about some of the various programming challenges involved. I'm calling this game Blocks. It's a clone of the earliest version of the game Tetris. And this is the first game running on my CPU that uses all the main parts sound, VGA, and the controller input. I've got a lot of good memories playing this game on some of the classic 8-bit systems, such as the NES and the SNES and the Game Boy, and so I was keen to develop a version of this for the system. I'll include a lot more play footage at the end of the video. So I'm a computer game developer by trade, and I've said from the very beginning of this build that my number one aim is to be able to have a system that I can develop some computer games for. So this is the first one I've developed that uses all the core systems, so the sound and the video hardware. I have previously done a UART-based serial terminal game, SNEC, and at some point I'm hoping to do a up-res of that into the VGA with sound, etc. But for now, this is my first game that actually uses all the main core parts of the system, and I'm really pleased that I've got it working, and the fact that the game is just this kind of quintessential, very basic puzzle game that you see on a lot of platforms. There was, however, some challenges developing it, and as always, I like to show and discuss those problems and the way we solve them. So let's jump into the code and take a look at it. First thing I did was define the pieces. Now, I actually first defined these on a bit of graph paper. And when I did that, I made it so every piece had four rotations. Now, this doesn't seem outwardly to be true. The square piece is rotationally similar at all four steps, so it never changes. The long thin piece, it only really has two states it's ever in. But because some of the pieces had four unique representations, I set up space for four unique representations for each of them and then just duplicated where necessary. Working like this makes the code a lot simpler. First thing I did with the graph paper copy is hand convert those to binary. And now I could define it as a little block of data in the code. Each of the pieces was defined on a four by four grid. And I've got four bytes for each of the seven pieces in each of the four rotations. You can see here, the first piece is the square, and it has the same four bytes of data replicated four times because all four rotations are the same. So then I took that data and used a simple piece of code on the PC to generate an image. So this meant I had a piece of image data that I knew matched the internal binary representation exactly. And I hand edited that for visuals. Initially, I just set colors on it and then I made the shapes a little bit 3D. Each of these pieces is four by four squares. Each of the squares I defined as three by three tiles. So we've actually got 12 by 12 tiles for each of the pieces. So that's 144 tiles. And the way I stored those was with a simple run length encoding system. Now this mirrors a system we used to use for software sprites where the compression mechanic actually becomes a form of optimization. Because with run length encoding, what we're doing is switching between sequences of value, in this case, commonly the black transparent color, which are replicated, and the more complex data, which is normally stored just as a sequence of values without additional run components. The decompression code can skip all of those transparent sections and only needing to do significant processing on the opaque data. So all the pieces end up being referenced in this table which gives an offset into some raw data, which is a variable size per piece. You can also see that where I've got rotational similarity, I've got compression code, which spots the identical data and then just re-references it. So my data format is actually very simple. The first two bytes are an offset. Then I presume I'm writing a set of bytes, which is a multiple of three. Assuming the multiply means I can unroll this loop slightly for a bit more speed. And then the next value is a number of bytes to skip. And repeating this the right number of times will draw the resulting piece on the screen. 
I've also got a additional version called undraw piece, which does exactly the same thing apart from it always stores black in the area with data. And so it's used to undraw the piece from the screen, overwriting only the bits that the previous version wrote. So next interesting thing is defining the graphical screens themselves. And I designed them just in a regular image editor. So this is the output for my main game screen. So in previous bits of code, I've used an 8x8 system font, which just uses one tile entry per character. But in this case, I used more tile entries for each character and just converted the text strings you see on the screen as bits of image data. This enabled me to have you know, larger text on the screen, which made more sense for the visuals of this game. Then I used code for extracting the unique 8x8 tiles from the image and separating out the tile data and the tile map. Now I'd already stored off tile data for the game pieces, so it was only the unique bits on here that needed any specific data. And this visualization actually just shows you which portions of the screen generated unique tile data pieces, which is not very many at all. Here's the image for the front end and that doesn't define very many either. It's so mostly just the text consumes quite a lot of data, but it didn't come close to consuming all 256 tile entries, even with the ones defining the pieces already taken out. So let's talk about the game code. Now, internally, the game uses the binary representation I first created for the pieces, and then I have a representation of the playboard that uses a 16-bit word for each line. I have 16 bits and the board is 10 squares wide, needing only 10 bits. And so I have six bits free to create a boundary on the left and the right with three squares that are solid. And that simplifies the game code as well, because that means I don't need to account separately for the left and right boundary of the play area. I just have the pieces moving within the 16 square wide table and then the pre-entered solid sections restrict the motion of the piece without any additional code. Here's my board reset function. That's just going to go through and set the least three significant bits and in the second byte the three most significant bits to create that three square boundary down the left and the right hand side of the board. Also, the game code that interacts with the board predominantly uses two simple functions, test place piece and place piece. Test place piece, it takes the X and Y position of the destination piece, which specific tile it is and its rotation, and it inquires whether or not that piece will clash with any existing set location. And then place piece is actually setting the locations to say that that piece has been stored in that location. You can very much think of this as the logical result of an AND operation between the pre-existing board and the new piece, and an OR operation to set the relevant bits. So this is the game code running in the simulator, but it does give you a quick look at the debug code I was using for a significant portion of development, where on the right hand side I have a debug visualization of the binary representation of the, the play area. So you can see pieces don't exist there while they're moving, only when they stop moving and I call place piece do they actually appear in that uh, representation. Overall, this game ended up being about 2,700 lines of dedicated assembler, but I did expand some of my general purpose library code during the course of writing this, which is gonna be handy for future game development. The last thing I should mention is the Falling Bricks logo. And the way this was done was quite simple. I worked out the actual arrangement of blocks in an image editor, and then I wrote this table. So this is the X and Y position that the block must end up in in order to spell out the word. That's the actual tile identifier and its rotation. And then this third value is a sequence indicator to say when it should arrive. So I simply have a ongoing time value of the animating logo. I subtract the sequence value, clamping at zero, and then add that to the Y coordinate. And this means that all the pieces will just fall down in the correct order and land where I need them to. Well, I hope you found that interesting. It was really enjoyable for me to explore a bit of serious game development on the platform, although you probably don't want to know quite how much time I spent on this so far. There was an awful lot of time spent not just developing the game, but just developing some of the fundamental libraries you need just to do this kind of work on the platform. So I'm really fleshing out my code base on all of this. Now, I want to develop several more games for this platform, and the very next game I'm going to develop is a little bit interesting. 
I've decided I'm going to try and enter a 48 hour game jam. So the challenge there is to develop a game in 48 hours. And that's quite a, a steep hill to climb for this project because I can only do this in 100% assembly language. So my starting library code that I've been developing along the way is going to help me with that, but it's going to be a very interesting challenge. I will do some videos along the way updating you about the progress. And when I finish, I'll do a nice big video in the same way of this one, showing you the game, talking about the experience and showing you the code and its challenges. As always, a big thanks to all my patrons and supporters. I'm really enjoying this whole process and I hope to see you again soon. Goodbye.